Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Off The Clock. I'm your host, Sierra Jones. Here at Off The Clock, we support cancer awareness, and we believe that one of the key ways to be cancer is early detection. Today, we have legendary Alabama a and head coach, Coach Van Petaway. We will begin a glimpse of his life before and after retirement, and he will be giving us a game plan on how to defeat cancer. Off The Clock starts now. <music> Coach, let's tip this thing off. All right. Who is Van Petaway? Well, Van Petaway is a very simple guy. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I'm one of eight children. My, my mother, uh, Collins and Alma Petaway, there were eight of us, four boys and four wow. girls. And uh, the biggest thing is that my, I, I come from, a, I'm a PK. My father's a minister. So uh, I know a lot of times our fans didn't, didn't see that when I was on the <laughs> sideline. But, uh, you know, we, we come from a very religious family and mm. I... Gave my life to Christ at an early age. And so uh, then I got into coaching. I mean, what well, coaching became a part of me because of uh, the influence of a, a couple of guys. Uh, I had uh, my high school coach, my junior college coach, and, of course, my A&M coach. Uh, they all influenced me to uh, get into coaching. And so mm -hmm. that's how I got into basketball. But it's, it's, been, a, it's been a great uh, life for me. Uh, basketball in Alabama A&M gave me my wife. I met my wife uh, as a fresh when uh, we were students at Alabama A&M. And then, of course, uh, I had two daughters to mm. come through that marriage. And then, of course, we uh, adopted Alexander. So uh, basketball has been very good to me. And I'm fortunate to be a part of the a and Alabama A&M legacy. Ten of us, ten of the pedaways have gone through and walked across that stage at Alabama a and mm. So I'm real proud of that. That's awesome. You mentioned that when you started to become a coach, what exact age were you and what was the moment that you knew that you were going to be a coach? Well, I was a, I was a freshman, uh, a freshman in college. Okay. And I had an opportunity to coach the upper bound Olympic team mm. because the guy that was supposed to coach it got sick and Ms., uh, Ms. Ira Duggan came to me and said, uh, you played basketball, so you're going to be the basketball coach. <laughs> and so from that, that that's why I got the bug. Uh, we, mm -hmm. I coached the team. We, we, we had about 11 games that summer, mm -hmm. and uh, we did a great job with the kids, and I really liked it. And I said, you know what? I think this is what I want to do because uh, going into that, I thought I was going to be an English teacher. That's what I wanted to do because one of, the, one of my favorite teachers was my English teacher. She was probably the the hardest lady uh, teacher that I've ever had. Mm. And I think she's probably one of the first people to check me. In other words, I couldn't do anything in her <laughs> class. All other classes, I got a chance to cut up and, mm -hmm. and, and be Van Petaway, but nope, she made me sit on the front row and she made mm. me be quiet and do everything that she asked me to do. And so she influenced me, uh, Miss Stallings, uh, Betty Stallings was, was her name. And uh, uh, I thought I was gonna be an English teacher until I got the coaching boat. So I know that players have their own pregame ritual, but as a coach, did you have any type of pregame ritual that you did before the game? Well, games? the only thing, uh, I, I like gospel music. I used to always have to hear something from the Williams brothers. Okay. Especially if I was uh, driving uh, to the game. I mean, from, from my house to Elmore, mm -hmm. I would have to listen to the Williams brothers. I, okay. I, I, I love them. And, and then uh, when it came to where I was not driving, as long as I was in, uh, I was off to myself, I was able to just think about the game, think about different things that would happen in the game. I had to have that a long time, mm. just me and myself and the man above. Yeah. Did you eat anything in particular? No, 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 no. no. Uh, Pre-game was always like uh, at around 2 o'clock. Okay. So from 2 o'clock on to after the game, I, I had nothing. Uh, I just tried to drink water and then didn't want to drink too much of that because, you, you know, you might have to leave the game right. before, before it was over with. But, uh, that, that, in terms of, of rituals, that, that was about it for me. Now, when I, when I was smaller, when I played now, when I played basketball okay. in high school, I could not play without drinking grapefruit juice. Really? I had to drink grapefruit juice, <laughs> yeah. It's like a sip, like the whole thing. <laughs> yep, the whole thing, the whole thing. I had to have a quart, a, at the time, a, a quart of grapefruit juice is what I had to drink. That is yeah. funny. Yep, that is yep, 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 yep. So look, I know the game has changed a lot. 
what is, is there anything that you would take out or that you would add, just even rules, just anything in general that you would change by the well, game Well, I think the game is more wide open. It's, it's positionless now. Back when I mm. coached, I wanted a low post game, so I'm going to have a center that could play or a forward that could play with his back to the basket. But now uh, everybody's playing five out, yeah. dribble drive, and all of this kind of stuff. I, I, the game has not changed. The name of the game is to score points. Mm. So even with the way they're playing now, I know for a fact that we could still score some points because I'm going to do it on the defensive end. I'm going to turn you over because I want the ball back. See, a lot of people thought, uh, oh, you know, he, he, he's playing defense, defense. No, no, no. I'm playing defense to play offense. Mm -hmm. I wanted that quick turnover. I wanted to score as many baskets as we could out of transition. Mm -hmm. So that has not gone away. When you look at the teams that, that are real successful now, Sierra, they're, they're still doing it the same way. They're, trans, yeah. they're playing transition basketball. The only difference is now you got five people on the floor who can shoot from the perimeter. Yeah. Whereas before, uh, I would always have a guy who could specialize. I could go to this guy on the block mm -hmm. and I could count on and back him. Back to a basket right, post. Mm -hmm. count, count on him giving me something. So from that aspect, nothing has changed about the game. Mm -hmm. You just got to score the points in yeah. order to win. And coach, it's rare to find a coach that's been at a school for the long time that you were. How? What just made you stay, or just did you just have that big of a love for A and M? Yeah, my school, I, I've got that love for Alabama A and M. Mm -hmm. That's why I still do stuff up there now because that's my school. That I mean, like I said, they gave me everything. They they gave me my job. They gave me my wife. My my, my kids went to school mm -hmm. there. They 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 participated in camps. They did everything there. So. Uh, Alabama A&M is in me. It's in my family. So mm -hmm. I stayed because I had great people to work with. I went through seven presidents. I had a great time with, with the people that there that were there uh, in the administration. I had some great athletic directors. I had great coaches. Uh, my coworkers, see, th this is what you tell kids now. Find something that you love, and then you'll never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I, I thought. That's the way I looked at it. I enjoyed going to work. We, as a group of coaches, we very rarely left each other. We stayed together. Mm. We, the only time you, you miss work, when you took your little family vacation or if you were ill. Other than that, we showed up because we like being there. We like being together. There, I mean, all the coaches, not just basketball, we've had great football coaches. Our track coach, Coach Henderson, Coach Parham on the women's side, we just had a bunch of great coaches up there. And then toward the end of my career, Coach Warmly, uh, Coach Jones in football, all these people were great to work with, so mm -hmm. uh, to be with every day. So uh, that camaraderie that Alabama a and gave, when, when you recruit kids, we tell them it's a family. Mm -hmm. and, and then we prove that as coaches in the way that we uh, talked to them, the way we dealt with them, and we showed them that family love that some of the kids didn't get from where they came from, but they got it at Alabama a and And I'm proud of what I, my assistants did, the coaches and the administration that helped those young men develop, mm -hmm. matriculate, get their degrees, come there to play basketball and put Alabama a and basketball on, help to put basketball on the map. Mm -hmm. Coach, I wish I could have played for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I got to see if you played, you could have played for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, before we go on break out, one more question for you. So the younger coaches out there, is there any advice that you would give them? That's yeah. what you know now. Well, yeah. Uh, basketball is, is, is a great way to reach the young people. Mm. That's a great way to reach it. But you got to have a commitment. You got to be committed to it. And then you have to be yourself. That's what I would tell any young, young coach. Be yourself. But you cannot do all the X's and O's unless you get some Jimmy's and Joe's and you got to work with those people in order to get what you want out of them. And so you got to put the work in. If you don't put, you know, a lot of people just look at it for the, the glamour, you know, the game time. No, the work comes well before game time. Mm -hmm. You got to have those kids prepared. They got to believe in you and you have to live it. You have to live it for them to see it. And if they buy into it, then you can be successful. Mm. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. We'll be right back. Stay tuned for what's next. Hello Huntsville will be a weekly lifestyle audio and video podcast produced in studio and on location to showcase Huntsville's best activities, entertainment, neighborhoods, and all the opportunities that make the Rocket City one of the top cities to live in the nation. Cynthia Joyner will be the host. 
Hello Huntsville's primary audience will be adults who live, work, play, and innovate in the Huntsville metro area, and each episode will feature Cynthia in conversation with business owners, decision makers, elected officials, and some of the city's most compelling personalities telling the stories of her hometown. Whether you're a local, new in town, or just passing through, Hello Huntsville will have something for you. Coach, we just got out of a timeout, and I thought of a new play. So look, uh, your whole time at A&M, what was the most memorable game, or if there's more than one? Well, it would have to be more than one, okay. uh, Sierra. I, I think uh, one of the first ones, uh, I think it was back during the 88 season, mm -hmm. uh, we were in the playoffs, and we were down by 20 at halftime, and uh, it was a sellout crowd up in Kentucky, and I think they had won 157 straight non-conference games in that building. Wow. And uh, we went to the locker room, and we had a come-to-Jesus moment with the team. And we came back, and uh, we won that game by, I think, six or seven. That was one of the greatest moments, and that, that was early on in my career, too. Mm -hmm. I think that might have been year three as, as a coach. And then, of course, as, as we moved on, I think one of the biggest uh, games that I can remember, when we first went to Montgomery to play our rival, Alabama State, in the new arena, the Aquadome. Mm -hmm. You had a standing room only crowd, and... I told the guys before the game, I said, you know, the only reason why we're here, when people open a new building, they always bring somebody in that they can beat. Mm. I said, so that's why they have you in here. Mm. I said, they're, they're here to serve you up for their people. I said, so if you want to do something about it, you want to spoil their party, we need to go out there and execute our game plan. We won. We won that game. In fact, the first five years that we played in the Aquadome, we, we won. Mm. Uh, then when Lewis Jackson came in, he turned that thing around. And then uh, probably the, the last game that I, uh, that's memorable for me would be uh, the first round of the playoffs uh, in Dayton, Division I. And that was a game for me because that's the same year that I had a lot of health issues. Mm -hmm. and, and to be able to have a team to, uh, to make it that far and do what they did that season, uh, that was one of the most memorable games, uh, the open round of the playoffs. Even though we lost, mm -hmm. uh, the other two games we won, but I remember that game probably sticks out in my mind more than any other time. Mm. And Coach, while you mentioned it just now, but I know this too, so during your career you did have some health issues. You were diagnosed with prostate cancer. Correct. Can you walk us through the, the moment that you found it and all that? Okay. Right. Uh, after the season, every year I, I would take a physical. And uh, after the season, uh, it, was, it was in April, I went to my doctor, did the normal uh, test and stuff. And then two days later, I was out on the, on the water fishing, mm -hmm. my favorite pastime. And I got a call from his office. And uh, they, the nurse said, uh, Coach, uh, Dr. Williams needs to see you. He needs to see you. I said, well, no, you can just tell me what it is, and, and I'll, I'll check it out. She says, no, Coach, you're going to have to come in to see. And so when I went in uh, the next day, uh, he told me that uh, uh, I had, they think that I had cancer, they needed to take some more tests. They did some more testing, and then uh, in April, we, we did another test, and then three months later, we did another test, and the cancer was growing. Mm -hmm. And so I knew at that time that we needed to do something about it. So we came together. We, we had a, a team, Dr. Scott Williams, uh, Dr. Childs was my oncologist, and then uh, I had a urologist, James, Dr. James Reynolds. We put our heads together, and then we came up with a plan. And so uh, in September, uh, before the season started of that year, uh, I did, uh, I had radiation and uh, I had surgery. And that was in 2004. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still here mm -hmm. because it was early detection. I think the biggest thing that I'll tell anybody, especially the males, uh, early detection is the key. And after that, Sierra, I joined the board of the American Cancer Society and I was a spokesman for them. I've been getting the word out. I tell men anytime. We as men, we don't like to go to the doctor, but you have to. Mm -hmm. You have to. And then as a coach, I've always, I knew every year the season is so stressful, I always wanted to get a physical at the end of the year. And I did that. So I had early detection because the year before I didn't have a cancer. And so that helped me early detection, the radiation, the surgery. I'm still here. I love it. 
Uh, God gave me another lease on life, and I took advantage of it. So that was in 04, and then I continued to coach. I coached because there was no reason to quit. Mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 the cancer was gone. Um, it, it did not, the only thing I could not do after I first uh, was diagnosed or had the surgery was blowing a whistle was a problem. I could mm-hmm. not blow that whistle, but that's what I had assistance for. Mm-hmm. You know, they all had brand new whistles, so they had to use them. <laughs> so, uh, but, but, but that was it. I mean, other than the radiation making you tired, uh, but you get tired anyway. So mm-hmm. I was able to, to persevere. So from 04 to 2011, I continued to coach and uh, we, uh, we got things done. Mm-hmm. How did you balance that? How did you balance? It, it was tough because see, the big thing was, uh, I'm a, I was a very private person. I didn't want to go public, but then uh, uh, I was just like everybody else. When I first got the diagnose, diagnosis, I said, why me? Mm. And then, I, and then it seems like the man said, why not? You know, you got this platform, use it. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I started doing. And so what I had to do, I had to break it down to my, to my uh, family first. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, my wife is still mad with me because uh, I kept it to myself so long. I, I told my wife four days before the surgery. Mm-hmm. I told my parents the day before the surgery, the night before the surgery, rather. And because I didn't want anybody to be worried about me, mm. you know, and that's just the way I am. So, and then uh, with my daughters, I had to let them know that, hey, if we do what the doctors say, we're going to be okay. So you don't have to worry. I'm going to be here. I'll be here to walk you down the aisles. I'll be here uh, to see you graduate. And, and then, you know, I've accomplished all of that. So, but, but letting the family know and, and uh, just having that balance in your life. As a coach, you got to do that anyway. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I tell all the young coaches, Families come first. You know, you, you got you to gotta look out for your family. You got to be dedicated to your job and to your craft. But God put you here to take care of your family if you have one. Mm-hmm. And so that's what, that's what I tell the coaches. You got to make sure that you carve out space in your life for your families. And that's why you see a lot of coaches uh, who, don't, who don't do that, they have this burnout. Mm-hmm. They, don't, they don't last doing it that way. So you gotta you gotta make it a priority to have balance in your life, mm-hmm. and if you're using him upstairs, he'll help give it to you all the time. Yes, he, he will. He's good. Yep. Yeah. And last thing, Coach, is anyone watching right now that is currently got the news that they are diagnosed with cancer? Is there anything that you would say to them? Yeah. Uh, don't don't give up. That's deal with the man upstairs. Talk to the man upstairs. He'll help you through it. You know, all of us. God has given all of us. Uh, a, a way to go in life. God has given all of us. He's got a plan for all of us mm-hmm. and he's not through with you yet. So you continue to do what you s- lean on your doctors, lean on your faith, talk to the man upstairs. And I think everything will be all right. You're an absolute inspiration. You are, <laughs> you are. And it's very encouraging, very, very encouraging. Well, we're going to be right back. We'll hear more about his life after retirement. The greatest asset we have is our employees. I'm very excited to welcome you to our new corporate website. The National Space Club was founded as the National Rocket Club in 1957. In North Alabama, we are extremely blessed. The Truth Home will test your theory in everything. The good things and the bad things, in everything deal him Just went into overtime. <laughs> Look, you've been coaching for 25 years at AM. 
So what what are you doing now? How's how's life after coaching? Well, I'm I'm probably doing more now, Sierra, than I was when I, I was coaching. You. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, my my place pretty full. I'm I'm the chairman of the Huntsville Madison County Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh, that takes up some of my time. I'm a member of the uh, Fellowship of Faith. I, mm-hmm. I work with the uh, food distribution, uh, so we do that on a monthly basis. And uh, then there, there are other things. I do podcasts. I got a, a podcast with the Carlos Brown Show. I'm a regular guest on that. We do that every Saturday morning. And then during the football season, I'm with the Dr. Prince Show out of uh, Texas, mm-hmm. and uh, we, we talk football or, or whatever sports topic that, that's hot during that time. And then, of course, uh, when I first retired, I started with the SWAC Digital Network. I was a color analyst for that. I'm also currently I, I do the uh, I help with the Alabama Junior College uh, broadcast as a color analyst. I do all of Alabama A&M's home men's game and some women game uh, as an analyst. And then, of course, uh, I work the SWAC tournament. So uh, there there are a couple of things that I'm doing, but. The, the, the podcast and being a part of basketball, uh, that's still a part of my life. Mm-hmm. And, and believe it or not, Sierra, in May of uh, 21, I just stepped down or my term ended as a, uh, a member of the NC2A Basketball Ethics Coalition. So, mm-hmm. uh, that, so I'm only two years removed from that. And we would meet uh, uh, during the course of the year. Uh, we, met at every, we would meet at every Final Four and so basketball has still been a part of my life. Uh, I'm a member, uh, a board member of the College Insider Basketball. We we put teams. Uh, we do a CIT tournament, postseason tournament, and so I'm I'm part of the selection committee on that. So I'm still a part of basketball. And then I've got friends who are still in coaching. Mm-hmm. So I help them with uh, athletes, uh, recruits in this area, recruits in the state of Alabama. If there's a kid that they want to know about, I help them do the research on it. Most of them I get a chance to see play, and and I do it for the men and the women. You know, uh, uh, that, that's why I was blessed to get a chance to see you play, Bob mm-hmm. Jones. Uh, uh, I don't just watch men's basketball; I watch good basketball. Mm-hmm. So whether it's on the the, uh, the the female or the male side, I'm out there. I just love the game of basketball. I I like the life lessons that the game teaches people. Mm-hmm. But do you do you miss coaching? Yeah, sometimes, Sierra, I do. I have missed it, but then I know why I'm retired. <laughs> but no, no, no. The, 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 the kids are different. And I, I think kids want, mm. they want to know that you love them. They want yeah. you, some kids still want to be coached. Mm. Um, I, I, I do miss it sometimes, but uh, life is a lot easier when, when you're not doing that grind right now. Mm. Well, then let's go back to what you mentioned, that all the many things that you do after retirement. So you mentioned about being an analyst color commentary. So do you find yourself sometimes coaching while you are broadcasting on air? All the time. Yeah. All the time. That, that, that's instant. That's been in me because you got to remember now, I, I was also three years as an assistant coach. So mm-hmm. that's uh, what 28 years of, of coaching. So it's in my blood. So sometimes, yes, when things are happening on the floor, you, I, I will blurt out what's getting ready to happen next uh, because I'm coaching. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I'm thinking what I would see coming to happen next or what I would like to see happen there. So you do it sometimes, and that's just a part of it. But I, I think if, as a color analyst, as long as you painting that picture for the public, mm. you, you're doing your job. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I like being a color analyst now because, see, I'm undefeated. I'm undefeated <laughs> as a color analyst now. You know, so when you go into coaching, you're going to have that one loss record. Right. You know, we, we, were, we were successful. I mean, we, if you win 450-some games on a collegiate level, I think that's, that's pretty good. But as a color analyst, I am undefeated. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, Coach, be honest. You ready? Yeah. What do you like better, uh, being a coach or a color, na- uh, color commentary? I'd rather do color commentary any day than a coach. Really? No, no, I'm just teasing. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, no co- coaching is still in my blood. I, I could still do it if I had to. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm enjoying visit, visiting different schools, seeing different teams come in, and knowing that, once we unplug for the night, mm-hmm. it's over with. Mm, yep, that's yep, true. That's yep, very, very true. Yep. Well, Coach, thank you. And look, we know that he is a legendary coach on the court, off the court. He does a million things, but also he's a really good cook. So stay tuned and see this shrimp pasta.
Welcome back. Coach, I know you're a great coach. Looks like you're a great cook, too. <laughs> Tell me what you got here. Well, we, we're going to do uh, some uh, Cajun shrimp pasta. Okay. Uh, you know, for the sake of time, I've already cooked, got the noodles ready. Uh, they're half done. Now all I'm going to do is go ahead. Uh, they're completely done, rather. And all I'm doing now is adding the shrimp. We're going to stir it up and put some more sauce in it. Mm -hmm. And Sierra, we'll be ready to plate this. Looks like you added, what kind of seasoning I can add? Can well, add oh seasoning? yeah, yeah, it's, it's no secret. I, I use uh, Cajun, I use Cajun uh, seasoning okay. along with, um, I use also garlic salt, and, I mean garlic powder, I don't use any salt. Okay. Uh, so you put a little garlic in it, some seasoning salt, and you get all, you get this mixed up, mm -hmm. and uh, this will be ready here shortly. All it takes is the time to, uh, to get it all mixed up. I cheat by buying the sauce. Uh, some people make their own sauce. I don't have time to do it all. Mm -hmm. So that's how I get by with this. And this is a real quick meal. I can do this uh, from start to finish. It's about 30, 30 minutes. Okay. And uh, it, my family really loves it. And I showed you earlier the Cajun seasoning mm -hmm. salt. You see how far I use it? Yeah. There's only a little bit left. <laughs> yep. So my family really... Uh, my wife is from Florida, so she really likes the Cajun stuff, and so mm -hmm. we, we do it uh, quite often. Do you ever add anything in it, like extra like veggies or a different meat? Or well, well, no, we'll, we'll have a salad on the side. Okay. But, but, but today, for, uh, for you all, all we're going to do is we're just going to do the, uh, the shrimp pasta itself, but we would have a, a garden salad to go along with this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, Coach, I, appreci I can't wait to taste this myself, but I appreciate your time and just... You're, you're an inspiration. You're very encouraging what you shared today. Well, this has been, it, it's been great. Uh, God has really blessed me. And I think uh, when he blesses you, you are supposed to pass it on. And mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't mind sharing with people. Uh, this is just me being me. Because other than, than coaching and all the other stuff I'm doing, I'm out on that water fishing. So mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure <laughs> I'm fishing. I, I, I eat my own fish. So I'm one of the people that will, yeah, I'll will just, here. here we go. I, mm -hmm. I'm one of the people that uh, when I fish, unless I'm in a tournament, mm -hmm. uh, I eat what I catch. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I yeah, love yeah. that. Well, those out there watching, if you would like to follow Coach Petway and his uh, podcast, you can click that link below. And then if you would like the recipe, you can scan the QR code. Yeah, this is my recipe now. Not, yes. not somebody else's yes. now. Yeah. And you added your own ingredients yep, yep, to yep, it. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Join us next week to see who's off the clock.